Good morning, everyone, and welcome to In the Know, Effective Pre-Employee Screening and Post-Employment Testing. I'm Vinny Civitello, Communications Manager for the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. With us today are Liz Garcia and Amy Guerin of Parker McKay. So a few housekeeping matters before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you tomorrow along with the PowerPoint for today's presentation. So be on the lookout for those. I'd also like to draw your attention to the questions tab. Liz and Amy would be happy to take all of your questions, so don't hesitate to write them in as they come to you. And I want to stress that, write them in as they come to you because you may forget what you want to know by the time we hit the Q&A. So now let's get things started. Liz? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today on this um, beautiful day in Trenton. Um, anyway, a little bit about us. Amy and I work at Parker McKay. We're a large law firm in South Jersey, and we practice labor and employment law, and we also do some human resource consulting. So we get a lot of these questions on a daily basis. So as Vinny indicated, please feel free to ask us any questions. Um, I will indicate that you know our presentation is for informational purposes only, and that if you have any legal questions, you should always contact your attorney. Um, and that is a requirement that us attorneys actually put out there so that you understand that we can give you a lot of information, but a lot of information that we're providing is going to depend on going to depend on the facts of the the, the situation, the employer, the number of employees you have, the type of business, the type of, um, you know, whether you're in safety sensitive positions versus non-safety sensitive positions. So it's just good to keep in mind that this is more of a general discussion, but we will try to give you as much information as we can. So I want to start the presentation by talking about the offer letter. Uh, and this is important because any sort of pre-employment screening that you're going to conduct must come after you've decided to hire someone, with a couple of minor exceptions that we'll talk about in a little while. Um, the offer letter, when you want to do pre-employment screening, which includes any sort of financial background check, criminal background check, or drug test, has to be you have to inform the employee of that or the prospective employee of that in their offer letter. So we as attorneys call those conditional offer letters. Uh, what I wanted to do was to give you an all-encompassing offer letter. This is one that you could use anywhere from you know, your uh, laborers or your you know, people who are fill you know, in the stock room, whomever, uh, all the way up to the executives in your company. Um, clearly, if you're sending an offer letter to someone who is a minimum wage worker or someone who is in a more day-to-day -day, uh, labor type position or anything to that effect, you're not going to have a lot of this restrictive covenant language or other options like stock op op options or car allowances and stuff like that. So you don't have to include all of that in your cover letter. But a good cover letter, I'm not sorry, sorry not cover letter, offer letter, um, always starts off with a congratulatory introduction. It should always include the job title, and also basically uh, either a job description, the goals or the objectives, basically what you advertised for, so that when the employee gets the offer letter, they understand what it is that they're required to do. Some employers add the job description right to the offer letter, um, but you're not gonna do that in all instances. But it's good to articulate what it is the expectations for the individual when they're coming into the job. Obviously, you're going to put a salary. If you're um, in the industry that works on commissions, you're going to include that information. Any signing bonus, that should all be in there. Uh, but what we're here today to talk about is the conditional offer. Um, under New Jersey and federal law, any time an employer decides that they want to uh, get a criminal, drug, financial, or other type of background check, they need to put that in the offer letter as a conditional offer of employment. And that language really should be in that letter. It should be, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to bring you on board. We're excited to, to enter into work relationship with you. However, this is not 100% uh, of an offer letter until you pass these tests. And what we're going to talk about, Amy and I, today is what are some of the legal implications, what type of notice you need to provide, uh, and some other uh, information that may be helpful in making sure that you're compliant with the law, that you're not violating the law, and that um, you are following all the processes so that if you do make a conditional offer of employment to someone and they do come back with a uh, hit on a drug test or a criminal record issue that's concerning to you or any of the other um, 
uh, pre-screening things you do that in fact you're doing it in accordance with the law so that you don't get jammed up. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to quickly go through the background checks um, and Amy is going to talk about the first part, which is um, the EEOC guidelines, and then we'll go to the New Jersey Ban the Box, Fair Credit and Reporting, and then I'll end with uh, drug testing. Thanks, Liz. I'm glad to start our conversation around background checks. And of course, the first question is, can you perform a background check? And of course, the answer is yes, but within certain limitations. Uh, and those limitations, some of the basic ones are set out, as Liz indicated, in EEOC guidelines, in New Jersey's Ban the Box Law, and in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. When we talk about the EEOC guidelines, it might be helpful to have a little information on the EEOC. EEOC stands for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that's the federal agency that enforces the federal anti-discrimination laws. And there are a host of anti-discrimination laws, such as the uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and several others. The one we're really focusing on is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is the law we're all familiar with as the law that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, sex, religion, color, national origin, ancestry, or disability. Um, and we're all probably pretty familiar with that, that there are certain things, uh, certain ways that you cannot discriminate. The EEOC approaches discrimination in a couple of different ways, um, generally known as disparate treatment and disparate impact. So let's start with disparate treatment. That's when you use your background checks differently for people in different protected classes. So those categories I talked about, race, sex, religion, national origin, ancestry, those are, those are called the protected classes. And if you treat somebody differently on one of those bases, you are engaging in intentional discrimination. So having background checks for just your African-American employees or having background checks for just your Latino employees uh, or whatever the case may be, um, you're treating people differently on the basis of some protected characteristic. I'm pretty sure we all know that you can't do that. That's intentional discrimination uh, and that's strictly prohibited by the law. What's more difficult to wrap your arms around is what we call disparate impact. That's when you have a facially neutral policy that has a discriminatory outcome. This is generally your unintentional discrimination. So if you have a policy that says, I'm gonna screen everybody in this particular position uh, for criminal history, and you absolutely exclude people who have any type of conviction, what you may notice is that you're screening out different groups at a higher rate. Um, perhaps you're screening out African Americans at a higher rate or Asians at a higher rate or whatever the case may be. You don't intend to discriminate, but that's what the outcome is. That's what we call disparate impact. Uh, and disparate impact is, of course, prohibited by the EEOC as well. So when you hear all that, you probably ask yourself, well, what can I do with this information, if anything? And of course, you can always make a decision not to hire or to terminate an employee for criminal conduct if it's related to job, uh, if it's consistent with business necessity. It has to be job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, Determining that is really a case-by-case -case study. Uh, there's two ways to go about it. One is called a validity study. We're not gonna talk about that here today. Validity studies are very specific kind of studies. Uh, the requirements are outlined in regulation, and it essentially says that um, you know, screening on a particular basis uh, is acceptable. What more likely is going to happen is that you need to do a targeted screening. A targeted screening considers the nature of the crime, the time elapsed since the crime was committed, and the nature of the job. 
And in addition to considering those general factors, you have to do an individual assessment of whether the policy as applied to your job applicant or applied to your employee is job related and consistent with business necessity. So you can make decisions based on criminal history information, but it really has to be specific to the job uh, and it really has to consider the individual. Crimes that happened long ago in a person's past may not be a legitimate reason for screening them out. Uh, crimes that are minor that have nothing to do with the job at hand um, may not be a legitimate reason for screening someone out. Something that is consistent with business necessity might be, for example, your CFO or the person that handles your banking information. If they've ever been convicted of fraud or embezzlement, obviously those things are related to the job. Uh, and you may have a legitimate business reason for screening out that type of employee. That's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Just as general background, uh, the EEOC is very clear that arrest records are not treated the same as conviction records. An arrest is not proof of criminal conduct and you cannot treat it as proof of criminal conduct. So for example, um, it, you know, if someone is arrested for let's say a teacher in a school environment is arrested for having inappropriate contact with a student, you can't fire that employee just because they've been arrested for that kind of uh, accusation. However, you can still consider the conduct underlying the arrest and say that conduct, whether or not it's criminal, is unacceptable in my line of work or unacceptable for my business. So if we go to our teacher example, the teacher may have been arrested for inappropriate conduct uh, and then you as the employer would do an independent investigation, gather your own information about what the employee did or didn't do, and make an independent decision about whether something is appropriate or not. That is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Uh, and of course, the last point is conviction records uh, are proof, absolutely proof of criminal activity, and you can certainly rely on uh, conviction records when making decisions about whether or not to accept an applicant or to keep a person employed. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Liz to begin our conversation about New Jersey's Ban the Box Law. So before we get to uh, Ban the Box Law, I just wanted to add a few things to uh, Amy's presentation. Um, the EEOC and what she was talking about was related to criminal background checks. Uh, but the, the same analysis applies for when you're doing a drug test or any other type of test. Um, so when you're doing drug tests, again, is a conditional offer of employment, uh, you know, you, they, they are illegal under federal law and you have the absolute right to um, not hire someone if they've tested positive. But again, if that policy is impacting certain people or anything like that, um, it would just be, especially now with uh, the proposed or up soon to be proposed legislation on legalizing marijuana, there may be other things for you to look at in the future. And I just wanted to put that out there that right now we have no guidance on what we can and can't do with uh, drug tests if marijuana becomes legalized here in New Jersey. Uh, but just keep an eye out for, for updates on that um, because there may be uh, a lot of overlapping issues. But for your purposes now, if you do a, a conditional offer of employment um, and someone does come back with a positive drug test, as a, a private employer, you can certainly for any reason um, decide not to hire that person since it is illegal. But I will indicate in there that there's always a lot of false positives and there's also issues related to uh, people being on medication, uh, prescription medication legitimately, uh, that come back with fal false positives and just don't jump at it without at least looking at that first. Um, because again, this is a whole nother seminar in itself, but if you do perform drug tests as pre conditions of pre-employment, and that individual comes forward and says that this is based on a disability and he's on medication for a shoulder injury and that comes back as positive for some sort of um, you know illegal substance because that happens then the other parts of the law kick in you know now this is an individual who's an applicant with a disability and then you have other obligations under that law to to follow um, 
and again, that's not going to happen too often, but I just want everybody to be aware of that. Um, so, uh, you know, one part of it, and oh, let me start over here. Um, when I started the conversation, I indicated that a lot of times, and what we're going to be talking about is once you've decided to hire someone and you've given them the conditional offer of employment, um, that, that's when you can start adding, asking a lot of these questions. But the ban the box law is slightly different. Um, just as a little background, if you haven't heard of ban the box, um, it's the Opportunity to Compete Act, which went into effect in March of 2015. And um, it basically prohibits employers from making certain criminal record inquiries prior to um, meeting with the person, or at least having the initial application process. So, with Ban the Box, if you're in the application process and you're looking to hire more employees, employees are not, re first of all, your application, if, if you have an application and you haven't looked at your application in a very long time, absolutely look at your application. And if you have any questions in there related to whether or not the individual has ever been convicted of a crime or whether anybody has ever been arrested for a crime, remove it unless you're in a couple of specific industries, police officers, so if you're hiring police officers, nurses, doctors, things to that effect. So it's gonna be industry specific if you're dealing with um, individuals with disabilities in a group home, things to that effect. Uh, you still may be able to keep that in your application, but generally speaking, if you're just a general, more um, not regulated type of industry, uh, then you can go ahead and, and remove that, and you should remove that from your application process because of Ban the Box. So basically here, employers are not required, uh, cannot require applicants to complete any application that makes any inquiries about the applicant's criminal history during the, quote, initial application process. And the initial application process doesn't necessarily mean that it is only the application that we're talking about, a physical piece of paper that someone puts their name where they've worked before, things to that effect. Um, it can be the first interview. So a lot of um, businesses don't use applications. They just, you know, get a resume or they get someone's name from a friend or they get a referral to interview someone. During that initial interview, if you don't have an application, you cannot ask about someone's criminal history. Um, when can you ask about it? Well, you can ask about it once you've had an opportunity to meet the person, get to know the person, and learn about the person. This law is basically put in place to make sure that applicants who have had criminal uh, histories um, are given a fair shake. So employers cannot require orally or in writing about the applicant's criminal record during the application process. That goes, that bullet point there goes more towards the no actual application, but get referral and, and interview the person. Um, if an applicant volunteers criminal history information during the application process, then that's fine. You didn't ask about it. You're not in any violation of the law. But I am going to tell you that when you're interviewing people, you should be taking some notes. Uh, and there's a double-edged sword there. You don't want to take notes that are going to get you in trouble later on, i.e., I don't like this person because they're a Muslim, or this person um, smells bad and it's because of a cultural thing, um, things to that effect. You don't want to put any of that in your notes, but if someone during an interview says, um, and it's the first interview, no application, even if there is an application, says, you know, I want to let you know I've been um, arrested or I do have a criminal history, make sure that you document in your notes that the, the interviewee voluntarily provided you with that information during your first interview or during um, any of the initial application process. That is some of the best evidence you're going to have in the event someone does file a suit for violations of ban the box or any sort of discriminatory um, uh, violations based on any of the other rules is the paper documentation because ultimately let's be honest it's going to be your word against that person's word so with some documentation that's contemporaneous to the interview uh, that is some protection so as I mentioned employers can inquire about criminal history after the initial application process has concluded so such as during the second interview but it, or before the offer of employment. However, if you're going to actually do a criminal history check, that has to be 
only upon an offer of employment slash con uh, conditional offer of employment. So while you can, during the second interview, ask, hey, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Um, that's fine, but do not conduct an actual background check through a, an independent company or if you do it in-house uh, for some reason, if you have access to that, which only certain limited uh, types of companies would, uh, or employers, um, do not do that until the uh, conditional offer letter is submitted as we start off the interview. Uh, employers can still refuse to hire based on criminal history if such refusal is consistent with other laws such as anti, uh, or are not inconsistent with other laws such as the anti-discrimination. So if you're not make, making uh, the decision not to hire, there's a little bit of a typo in that. Um, uh, oh, it, there isn't a typo. It's if refusal is consistent with other laws, I apologize. Um, ultimately, so long as you're not making the decision not to hire based on the criminal history along with another reason such as race, gender, uh, national origin, ancestry, disability, then you can certainly refuse to hire. There's no requirement under Ban the Box that you hire someone uh, based on criminal history. And I'll also add that a lot of this depends on, uh, not a lot of this, Ban the Box itself doesn't really depend on it. But just keep in mind that, again, this presentation is more of a general presentation. If you're in the healthcare industry, if you're in um, industries where you're dealing with safety sensitive positions, people are driving trucks, forklifts, things to that effect, uh, you do have additional things and protections that you're able to um, fall back on and some of this is more of an iffy. Uh, just some quick exceptions to ban the box. So you can certainly put this in the application as I referred to earlier, employment with enforcement, law enforcement, corrections, judiciary, homeland security, emergency management, um, where criminal background checks and exclusions are required by law. Again, uh, hospitals, doctors, nurses, um, health care professionals, et cetera, or where the position is part of a program or systematic effort to employ persons arrested or, or convictions of one or more crimes. Um, so now we're going to go to the next slide, which is the Fair Credit and Reporting Act, which Amy is going to handle. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we're going to do just a really quick overview of the basic tenets of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's a broad law and encompasses a lot of things, and we're focusing very narrowly on background checks. Uh, in addition, you probably noticed that up until now, our discussion has really revolved around criminal background checks and criminal histories. The Fair Credit Reporting Act regulates those as well as any other type of background check you're going to do. So if you pull somebody's credit report or if you do more of an investigative process uh, with them, the Fair Credit Reporting Act governs all of that. Uh, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act really uh, involves and regulates what we call consumer reporting agencies, or CRAs. These are the criminal background checks and the other types of background checks, credit checks, what have you, that are conducted by third parties. Uh, and I imagine that most of you, if you're doing background checks of any sort, you're probably contracting with some sort of organization or company that specializes in this kind of work. Those companies are considered consumer reporting agencies uh, and are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Okay, so before using um, a, a credit reporting agency or a CRA, there are a couple of things that you have to do. Uh, and most importantly, you need to get the applicants or the employees written permission in advance. Um, they have to know and understand that you're going to be performing a background check before you actually do it. Uh, if you want to conduct periodic checks, so say you do it at regular one or two year intervals um, at the time of hire and then periodically after that, it has to conspicuously say so somewhere in the employment paperwork. You can't bury it in the bottom of a job application. Uh, it needs to be um, front and center in some kind of document that you have the employee or the applicant sign off of. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is very clear that a lot of this needs to be uh, understood that you, you can't bury the language somewhere where someone is likely to overlook it. Uh, 
You also must tell the applicant or the employee that you might use the, the information for employment-related decisions. And this really must be uh, conspicuously stated. Uh, you can't put it in a letter. You can't put it in the application. It must be its own document, um, what we call a standalone format. Uh, and this way, it is the, the employee or the applicant is very clearly notified of what you're doing uh, and how the information is going to be used. And it gives them an opportunity to uh, decline the process if that's what it is they want to do. Um, there are also things, you know, so there's the, the criminal background check, there's the credit history report and background check, and then there are these more uh, detailed investigative processes where you might actually go and um, do reference checks uh, or interview um, colleagues of the individual, something a little bit more in-depth. Um, those are permitted uh, within some limitations. Those are permitted by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But again, you really have to tell the applicant or the employee what it is you're doing and describe to them the process so they understand uh, what's going on and they have an opportunity to decline to move forward if that's what it is you want to do. Before you actually order the background check, you have to certify that you've done certain things and that you've complied with the law. So when you order it from a CRA, you tell the CRA that you notify the applicant employee and that you have their actual permission to move forward. Um, of course, uh, we would always recommend that this is something you get written permission, not just notify them in writing, but actually get a writing back that says they approve of this process. You also have to certify with the CRA that you've complied with all Fair Credit Reporting Act requirements. Uh, and finally, you have to certify that you're not going to discriminate against the applicant employee or otherwise misuse the information. And again, this is all information that you're gathering, uh, but your actual decision-making process, as we've talked about before, has to comply with EEOC guidelines for enforcing the anti-discrimination laws, and it has to comply with um, the background check timing issues that Liz talked about with Ban the Box. Before you actually make an adverse decision, so before you actually terminate someone or decline to make an offer of employment uh, or whatever the case may be, you have to give the individual notice of what you're doing and a copy of the report that you replied on for the decision. Uh, there's also a document that your CRA will provide to you called a summary of your rights under the Fair Credit Report Act. Um, this gives the applicant and employee a chance to review the information, uh, verify the information, and explain away any negative information. So you probably remember when we were talking about the EEOC guidelines, there was a process uh, for an individual evaluation um, for looking at the employee and looking at uh, the background and making sure that your policy as applied to the employee wasn't discriminatory, discriminatory in some way. Uh, this is another opportunity to do that, to do an individualized assessment. Hear what the employee has to say uh, and then consider uh, your options based on that. Does it mean you have to hire the applicant? Does it mean you have to keep the employee? No, you still as an employer uh, have the ability to make those decisions, provided that you're acting consistent uh, with the other laws. After you make an adverse decision, so if you decide not to hire that employee, or if you decide to terminate somebody's employment, you must tell the applicant that they were rejected because of information in the report. Um, they have to be really clear about the reason why. And this is because they, ha they have the ability to dispute the accuracy or the completeness of the reports. Uh, you can tell them that the credit reporting agency is not the entity making the decision. The decision is yours and yours alone. Uh, but they can go back to the CRA within 60 days to get an additional free report to see if any of uh, any discrepancies they identified are taken care of. Uh, or to confirm if any inaccurate information is removed. After you satisfy all record keeping requirements, you must securely dispose of this information. So typically we advise an employment 
uh, when you're interviewing individuals and collecting applications and going through the hiring process that you maintain your documents, all of your documents for a minimum of two years. Uh, and that's, you know, in case any lawsuits are brought, um, the necessary documentation uh, to defend that lawsuit is available. Uh, the EEOC also requires a minimum of two years for that kind of information. So you, you need to maintain it uh, for uh, a specific period of time, but once that time elapses, it's your responsibility to securely dispose of the information. So shredding it um, is one example of absolutely securely uh, disposing of information, or hiring one of these um, uh, companies that deals with um, shredding of documents or eliminating of sensitive information. And I'll turn it back to Liz for our discussion on drug testing. Before we get to drug testing, I just wanted to add, because I like to add, I like to talk, I'm an attorney, so of course I like to talk. Um, but uh, ultimately, I just wanted to add that a lot of times you can get through some of this, and I know that Amy said you can't bury this information in applications, um, but it doesn't hurt to put them in your uh, job description or your job advertisements. So if you're a company that you and you know that you're going to do um, yeah, credit checks, drug tests, background checks, anything to that effect, you can put that in your advertisement. Um, there's a couple of reasons to do that. So you're going to say something to the effect of uh, position is subject to background checks, including X, Y, and Z, drug testing. Uh, background, etc. Um, that is going to weed out some of the individuals that are going to apply. Um, that is not in any sort of contravention with ban the box because you're not asking the employee or the prospective employee uh, whether or not they have been uh, subject of a criminal action or, or conviction. Um, but it, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to put that out there. So that's another way to kind of get around, not around it, but at least to start building um, a good doc, uh, good file and documentation in the event there is a lawsuit. Hey, we we're not, we weren't hiding anything. We have been very clear uh, right from the get-go that this is a position that we were going to test for, etc. Um, the other thing that I wanted to put out there is that. Um, in certain industries, you may have to uh, conduct background checks um, for all the people in your industry if you're going to drug test or do a background check for certain positions. Other industries only require that you do a complete background check for safety sensitive positions or positions that you as the employer choose to do. Um, so in those instances, you really should contact your attorney to determine, you know, if there's any limitations based on your industry. Generally speaking, um, if you're a public employer, I'm not sure how many of you out there are public employers, uh, you have the ability to um, designate who you're going to do a drug, a pre-employment drug test for. Um, other employers, you're going to have to do drug tests for, for everybody. And then some, um, it, it's completely up to you. So just, just check with your attorney if you are in a specialized business to, um, to determine what is actually required of you if you decide to do pre-employment testing and pre-employment um, uh, background checks. So the next part is drug testing. So there's no specific law in New Jersey that prohibits or permits drug testing. Um, this is also the case in federal law unless um, you are a CDL driver or you're hiring a CDL driver or if you're in the medical field or dealing with individuals um, with disabilities. So there is, uh, th those are both in federal law and there's a couple of state laws that are specific to the healthcare system that um, permit and, and, um, and require in some instances. But for, generally, for general purposes, there's no specific law that deals with uh, drug testing and whether or not you can do it pre-employment. Just so long as when you do the offer, it's a conditional offer of employment based on this. I know I've said that a few times and I'll continue to stress that. Pre-employment testing is treated differently by the courts from random and suspicious testing, which is what um, you would do in the event you've hired someone and you decide to continue 
occasionally doing drug testing. Um, but with pre-employment drug testing, uh, it's permissible, again, after the conditional offer of employment is made. Um, before a conditional offer of employment is made, the employer can ask whether the applicant is using illegal drugs. Uh, so the ban the box thing, again, is just for criminal records. It has nothing to do with um, whether or not the person is uh, taking illegal drugs. You can ask that question. The likelihood is you're not going to get a truthful answer. Uh, so you, if it's really important to your industry and your business, uh, I would still... Um, require a conditional offer and having that testing done. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, some of this may be changing um, with some, you know, the, the, the rumor out there is that there is a push uh, once the new governor comes in to possibly legalize marijuana. So we have to keep an eye out once that legislation is introduced to see uh, what happens and what we can and can't do. What uh, and, uh, employers are going to have to put in place to make sure they're compliant. Uh, bottom line is that illegal drug use is still illegal under federal law, so uh, there, there's going to be a lot of discussion and, and policy changes uh, that employers are going to have to look at. So some employers may who um, want to, some private employers can say, well, you know, if we do a pre-employment drug screening after this law comes into place, if it does come into place, we're not going to decide not to hire someone because you tested hot for marijuana. Um, but there's nothing that will probably prohibit you from doing that because of the federal law. But again, this is me speculating. Um, so just keep an eye out. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to indicate as well is that you should never ask about prescription drug, drug use at the pre-offer stage. Um, because again, as I mentioned early on, it could be a violation of the American with Disabilities Act. And if you're doing the hiring and the individual tells you that they are on medication for one thing or another, then you have the implications of the Americans with Disability Act and having to provide reasonable accommodations. Again, all employers with 10 employees or more are required to provide uh, uh, reasonable accommodations to, even, to applicants in addition to employees, but only if you know about it. If you don't know about it, then you know they can't say that you violated it unless it's a, a disability that's obvious to, to to you looking at you know someone comes in a wheelchair or someone has a severe limp or or anything like that um, so i would never ask about any sort of prescription drug use at the pre-offer stage um, if the individual does get a drug test and um, it comes back hot at the pre-offer stage Again, the company that you're hiring to do the drug testing does have medical officers in place. And it's up to those individuals to, if, if the individual is saying that's a false positive or I'm on medication, that's a conversation that those medical officers through your testing company are going or should have with the employee. You should be uh, very limited in your involvement in those discussions. Um, and again, if that does happen to you, just make sure that you um, contact your attorney to make sure you're following the law so that you're not in violation of the ADA or the um, LAD. Um, one thing you can do at the pre-offer stage is that you can ask an applicant if they're capable of complying with your company's policies. Um, and I, you know, I'm a big proponent of all employers, no matter how small you are, of having a policy manual or a handbook and that your drug policies are in those handbooks. A lot of what we're talking about should also be included in your handbook um, just so that there's no question as to what your supervisors are allowed to do and not do when they're doing interviews, when they're um, you know, talking to prospective employees, things to that effect. So if you have policies in place, you're less likely to get in trouble. But that's a whole other topic in itself. Um, do not ask if an applicant is a drug addict or, e or ever been in the drug rehab program. Um, drug addiction, addiction is a handicap under the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination and non-using former drug, drug addicts may be uh, entitled or labeled disabled on the American Disabilities with uh, Amer the American with Disabilities Act. So therefore, again, in the pre-employment stage, um, don't ask those questions because that's just going to raise a whole other uh, body of law that you're going to have to comply with. Uh, and that's not only for, for drug addiction, it also applies to alcohol. 
addiction. Um, under the uh, under one of the laws, um, if you test positive for drugs. Um, but you're in a treatment program, you're automatically uh, entitled to reasonable accommodations and then you can't terminate the individual. Um, so if you don't know before you hire them and before the test results come back, your obligations are lesser. Um, random drug testing. So this is going to happen when you've actually hired the employee. Um, there's no legislative guidance on this subject, so practices are gleaned from case law and also from your policy manual. So for, you know, again, getting out of the pre-employment and getting into actual employment, you have to have a really good drug testing policy. Um, and again, it's going to be based upon your type of business. So some things will work for some of you, some things won't work for others. Uh, New Jersey Supreme Court has said that random drug testing in the private sector for safety sensitive positions is permissible. There's no guidance in what safety sensitive is, but what we've been able to glean from the case law is, you know, like in the picture, a forklift driver, anybody uh, driving a truck, um, anybody driving a vehicle as uh, part of their position. Um, Sometimes driving lawnmowers if you have a landscaping business. All of that may be um, considered a safety sensitive position. Again, it's going to be based on the facts of your business, so you should always contact someone for assistance. Um, it's also interpreted to mean that there can be no random testing of non safety sensitive positions. So if you're an employer and you, you know, you're um, not dealing with anybody who's dealing with any equipment that could hurt themselves or others. I mean, that's another more simplified way of safety sensitive, but it's not the legal term. Um, you cannot do random drug testing. So employees do have the right to continue to work and not have um, drug testing if they're in non-safety sensitive positions, which is the majority of employees, I would assume for, for a good majority of you. Um, and then we have the, Okay, my, never thank you. Um, the suspicion based. So you have an employee and um, and and you suspect that this person may have a problem. What can you do? Can you test them? Can you require them to be tested? Uh, first of all, you must have a drug testing policy in place before you do that testing for reasonable suspicion. And what does reasonable suspicion mean? Uh, you have a supervisor. The supervisor has come to you and said. You know, Joey over there is looking a little, a little distraught, a little uh, weird. His eyes are glassy. His pupils are small. He's slurring his words. That, that's, that's the reasonable suspicion. Um, your policy should actually, uh, again, be included in your policy manual. All your supervisors should know about it. But some things to include in your policy manual, just so that you know, and it is effective, and you can use it. Uh, and you make sure that your supervisors follow it. And a lot of times companies have policies, but their supervisors don't follow them. And that's just as bad as not having any policy at all. Uh, and uh, I'll just get back to, to, the, to the facts here. Um, you should indicate that there has to be at least two people observing the, uh, the, in, the employee's condition. Um, so one person comes to you if you're a supervisor or the owner, Go over, conduct your own observations, have a conversation with the employee, uh, you know, just see if you agree. Then you must document what you've observed. And this is going to be the best defense if later on the employee says, um, you know, you improperly had me drug tested. Uh, if you have, you know, yourself or in, and another person documenting that, that is going to be very good evidence for you. Um, you should have a facility and you should have a facility that is uh, open or a couple of facilities that work with the, the your business hours. So a lot of times um, I have had situations where there was a facility that my uh, client had, uh, but they had a 24-hour uh, work shift and the place obviously wasn't open 24 hours uh, and they were scrambling one night and ended up having um, to forego the test because it had it was too much of a duration based on their policy between the uh, observation and the uh, and the test. Um, so have a pol have a facility, have a contract with the facility. Tell the facility what your expectations are. Uh, tell them what your company does, etc. And never, ever, ever, ever 
allow the employee to drive themselves to the testing facility. I stress that because it's obvious and we all should know that we shouldn't do that, but I have had many, many situations where I get a call from an employer stating, oh, well, you know, we think that Joey is, is um, impaired and we sent him to the facility. Okay, who, who, who took him to the facility? Oh, he just drove himself. No, bad idea, okay? Um, not only is it a bad idea because there's no guarantee that the employee will actually go to the testing facility to get tested, uh, and then you lose that, um, that uh, test because you may, not you may not have any proof to terminate them. Um, the other part is that you are now allowing someone who is impaired to drive, and as an employer, if you do that, you can have certain liabilities that you're exposed to if that person gets into an accident especially if that person is driving in a company vehicle. So uh, I know common sense, but I still throw it out there because sometimes common sense is what we forget when we're in those type of situations. Um, and, um, you know, th there's other, again, each industry has other, uh, not each industry, some industries have other testing policies that they can use. There's some where it's a requirement that happen every year. Uh, you know, CDL drivers have certain requirements and those tests will always be done. They're entitled to random drug testing. If you employ CDL drivers, you should have that all taken care of. Uh, and also, if you do have CDL drivers, I just caution you that there's a, there's a body of regulation that it goes step by step as to what you have to do in the, event, in the event there is a positive drug test that comes from that. Same thing in the healthcare industry. Uh, with other industries, it's really gonna be more based on your policy. So um, we're going to get some, some of your questions now and we hope that you, you feel comfortable to ask us whatever you may have. Um, so, so thank you. Thanks, Liz. We actually have a bunch of questions already, but I want to give everyone else a moment to type in anything they have. While I'm doing that, I'll take a second to remind you about the handouts tab. Without fail, someone always asks me how they can download the PowerPoint slides, and they're right there. You open up the handouts, preemployment.ppt. You can download that right there. Underneath that is the questions tab where you can submit a question for Amy and Liz. And don't be shy. You're going to get a survey after this is over asking you how you liked the webinar. And whenever someone says something like, oh, I wish they touched on X. That's why I came on and they didn't talk about it. I always ask myself why they didn't just ask the question. You've got two experts here, so take advantage of them. And with all that out of the way, let's go to our first question. Um, Lori actually didn't have a question, but I'm going to turn it into one. So she says, in my experience, a positive drug screen is negated by the medical review officer if they can verify a valid Rx for that class of drug. A false positive would imply a person may still be taking prescription medication after the valid prescription has expired, which presents a bigger issue, a disability without proper ongoing medical treatment. How would you know, this is my question now, how would you know that the prescription expired? I mean, you can't ask about that, correct? Uh, that's actually a really great question. And while the employer um, can't specifically ask the question, the employer does have the ability, or the medical review officer also has the ability to contact uh, the employee and say, uh, I want verification from your doctor that this is a valid prescription. So depending upon your testing facility, a lot of times the medical review officer makes the contact with your, with your employee's physician. Um, and has that proof obtained directly. Um, and, I, and I have to say that the majority of the testing facilities that I have dealt with do that directly. Um, but I do have one situation that I'm actually dealing with right now where this issue came up. Um, and the medical review officer uh, contacted the doctor's facility and the doctor refused to provide any information. Um, so the other thing that we can do as an employer is ask the employee to allow their doctor to talk to the medical review officer or to your HR. Should, this should never be done by a supervisor. This should never be done by, you know, anybody except the person who is tasked by the company to deal with these issues. And again, hopefully you never have to be put in that, that situation because most employees who truly have a false positive, um, are going to want to clear it if it's a true false positive. So they're going to allow their doctor or at least encourage their doctor to communicate that to directly to the medical review officer. 
Cool. Maritza asks, um, if so can you ask if someone has been convicted of a crime on the application for a CPA firm? A, a CPA firm, to the best of my knowledge, is not one of those companies where you have an exception to the ban the box rule. Uh, as a general rule, unless it is specifically allowed by law, in the examples we gave in our presentation, such as law enforcement officers, um, corrections officers, employees of the judiciary, um, and has, as Liz has indicated, certain healthcare workers. Um, uh, unless they fit into one of those specific categories, you can ask someone on an application whether or not they've been convicted of a crime. Right, and, and I just wanted to add, um, there may be regulations that are directly related to specific CPA um, uh, individuals working in a CPA office, so you may be able to ask that question based on um, those laws. So I would have, to be quite honest, I'm not fully fluent in CPA regulations and what you can and can't do with them. So even though it's not specified in Ban the Box as one of the um, titles that you can go ahead and ask about, it may be permitted under a different rule or regulation that applies solely to CPAs. So we can get offline and, and look that up for you if you need us to. But at this moment, there may be that uh, extra law that we're not familiar with at the moment. Okay, Mary asks, when can the background check be started? Do we need the signed conditional offer back before initiating the background check? Uh, yeah, you should always have the, um, the conditional offer signed back because, again, if you start doing it and the individual hasn't approved that, um, or at least, well, I guess it could go either way now that I think about it. No? Amy's saying no. I'm, I'm trying to think if there's a way around it. I'm always trying to find things, ways around certain things. Um, but no, I think that the best way to protect yourself is to start it once you get the conditional offer letter back, uh, because then the employee has acknowledged that um, that, that is going to happen. And it also, you, you end up complying with the um, with the, the Federal Credit Reporting Act in giving the notice and the signed letter back is the best evidence that you have. And I just want to remind everyone, this is Amy again, that uh, you have to get specific permission from the employee in order to conduct the background check. So as Liz indicated, in your conditional offer of employment, that's the place where you're indicating this offer is subject to X, Y, and Z, and one of those criteria is a background check. Uh, you need to get something back from the employee in writing giving you permission to conduct that background check. Or, of course, the employee at that juncture may decide to withdraw themselves from consideration. Um, but the important part is, is that you've got that written permission uh, in advance of taking any steps to conduct a background check. Terry asks, how do I know if my company background check is improperly screening out employees that are in a protected class? So as Amy mentioned, there is a complete, there's an analysis that uh, is, is directed by the EEOC, which we didn't spend too much time on, and it's called the validity study. Um, that being said, you can also uh, do a very informal review of what's happening. So say, for example, you receive 100 applications, and um, the... Um, you end up with five people that you want to interview or only five people that qualify and they're all white men. Um, that may be an indication that there's something wrong with uh, the process. Um, so a lot of times it's looking at who the applicants are, uh, where where you're getting to, and who is being weeded out. And if you see that it's being, um, that it's affecting one protected class more than any other, that may be evidence of disparate treatment. I hope that answers the question. Anything else to add, Amy? Okay. Diane asks, should HR be stressing to an applicant that they shouldn't be giving notice to current employer, their current employer until all of the background checks are completed? I don't think there's any specific timing or advice you should be telling your applicants about when they give notice to their employer. Uh, I think the important part is to focus on 
your process and making sure the applicant understands your process. Uh, and if in your conditional offer letter and you're making it really clear, hey, this is not a done deal, you still have these extra steps to undergo, your applicant ought to be uh, knowledgeable enough uh, in knowing that it's not a, a for certain offer that they still have these other steps to take. Uh, if your applicant is asking you specifically, when should I notify my employer, you know, your response is, I can't really make that decision for you. That has to be your own decision. But I will tell you that this is not a final offer of employment, and it won't be a final offer of employment until all of these other steps are taken. Excellent. Patricia would like to know, um, we have one client that requests we do I'm guess she didn't say specifically what, but I'm going to guess drug testing. But not all the employees work for that client. How do we handle? Now, let's just say she's also talking about a background check. You could go either way, but so I uh, it's kind of it's kind of hard to a answer that question. Um, it sounds like you're talking about a joint employer type of situation where. Um, and again, it, I apologize, but it sounds like it's a joint employer situation where. Maybe you're a staffing company um, and there is testing done by the staffing company, um, but not necessarily by the individual that uh, is, is having the employee work. Um, in those instances, both companies are going to be responsible for any violations. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, let me go back to there. We have one client that requests we do it, but not all employees work for that client. How do we handle? Yeah, that's that, that's a very specific question. Um, well, if you want, give me a call. My my number's on there, and we can talk about the facts because I don't I don't feel comfortable answering that without more facts. But generally speaking, if you're talking about a situation where you're dealing with a staffing company or something similar to that, there is a lot out there that makes both individual or both companies uh, something called joint employers and you both may be responsible for whatever violations there are in there. Um, and it and it may not matter whether or not one, is, the, the individual is an employee of that company. Okay. Um, Suzanne asks, can drug manufacturers be considered for random drug testing? Uh, assuming that your company is the manufacturer, um, yes, I believe that um, there are regulations specific to that industry um, and for specific employees within that industry. But even if um, there isn't, um, when it comes to random drug testing, you have to be very careful. It has to be based on, again, permitted by law. Uh, so it depends on which employees you're referring to, even though um, you have some that are most likely able to be random drug tested. You may have some who are not in direct contact with drug manufacturing that may be exempt from that. And it's going to be a fact question depending upon, you know, your location, how many facilities you have, how many locations you have, where, who's actually uh, involved with all of that. So it's, a, a, again, I apologize. There's just no specific direct answer to that without us talking a little bit more and getting more information. So we're coming up on 12 o'clock. We have a lot of questions left. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this rolling as long as you guys submit questions and as long as Liz and Amy don't bounce out the door. But um, if you have to go, by all means, you're going to get a recording of this pre presentation emailed to you within 24 hours. So if you miss the end, don't worry about it. You'll always be able to catch it later. So our next question comes from James, who wants to know, what can I do if an individual tests positive for drugs after a conditional offer of employment? Do I need to worry about providing him with a reasonable accommodation to get treatment? So um, I'm assuming that the question is more based on, okay, we did the conditional offer of employment and then the individual um, tests positive for drugs and the question is now does the ADA apply? Uh, it's going to depend, and I know that uh, lawyers use that all the all the time, but it does depend. It depends on um, one of two things, whether or not 
the information disclosed to us at that time, um, the, whether the employee tells us that he's already in drug treatment and therefore he needs a reasonable accommodation to complete drug treatment. So there may be a possibility there that yes, you have to provide that reasonable accommodation. However, for drug testing, if they are not in treatment, um, then there may not be no obligation to do a reasonable accommodation. Again, it's gonna depend on uh, the conversation that you have with that individual. Um, so if you don't ask and they don't tell, then there is no obligation under the ADA and the LAD. But if you do find out that there is treatment going on and has been ongoing for a while, then the implications may be a little different. Lenora asks, if I have no written policy that states I can test for reasonable suspicion, but I think someone is working under the influence, what can I do? Well, Lenore, you must get a policy written <laughs> um, because that is your best defense in a situation. Let's just say, you know, a lot of times um, you're going to have to do what you have to do if it's really hurting your industry. Legally, you should never do a reasonable suspicion test unless you have a policy in place just so that all the employees know that, in fact, they are subject to that and that the employer has the right to do that. Um, and it also should indicate, you know, how the testing is going to be done. And that's all very important. Um, but at, like I said, at times, if you have a situation and you don't have that policy and you do it, uh, you know, as, as some of us lawyers say, you take a chance and see how it works. Sometimes you're not going to get any uh, pushback and you're not going to get any um, lawsuits, but there's no guarantee in that. So my recommendation is that you get a policy in place ASAP so that when the situation does come up that you're ready for it, because otherwise, um, if you do get sued, you're, you're going to be in a little bit of a trouble. I actually have two inverse questions here, so I'll ask the first one first. Um, are you Dave asks, are you allowed to give every employee when they first begin work a drug test? Uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, is, is if it's part of pre-employment screening and it's part of a policy that you uniformly apply across the board, then the answer is yes. The difficulty comes in once that person has been hired. Um, can you drug test after that? And as Liz has already gone uh, into extensively, uh, the only time you can do random testing is when it's in a for a safety sensitive position, uh, which of course is its own analysis because the court gave us no guidance on what a safety sensitive position is. Uh, or you can do suspicion based testing, uh, which is when you have a specific reason to believe that the person might be under the influence at the time. Excellent. The inverse question that I have from Morris, do I need to do criminal background checks and drug tests? Wow, there we go. Drug tests for everyone I hire, even if I only want to perform background checks for certain titles or positions. So um, I'll indicate that the best policy is always to do it for everybody, but I do know for some you know, employers that is a monetary um, issue that you need to worry about. Um, bottom line is that it's there's no blanket answer. It's going to depend on your industry again. So in some instances, uh, yes, you can choose who to um, test in the event that um, the regulations allow for you to do that in your uh, for your company. Um, but there's going to be other instances where you're going to have to test everybody. So again, it's a, a specific industry question. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> I'll only add to that, um, that it, the EEOC does talk about having specific um, targeted policy. So to Liz's point, it is easiest uh, and safest and the least risky proposition to do it to everyone equally across the board. But if that's not an opportunity uh, for you or if that's cost prohibited, uh, you, ha you can target background checks to specific positions. And I think the easiest way to illustrate that is if you have a CFO or somebody who handles your company's money on a regular basis or has access to money, that might be someone where you want to run a credit check 
whereas if you have somebody who's a laborer moving pallets of um, merchandise uh, using a forklift, you know, that's not necessarily someone that you want to do a credit check for. So if it's cost prohibitive to do everyone, you can certainly uh, target certain kinds of background checks to certain positions, provided that there's a legitimate business necessity. Anne asks, when an employee wants to dispute the CRA's report, do they have to request the additional report from the CRA within 60 days or after 60 days? You have the opportunity to request the report um, within 60 days. So, it, you know, is there a specific cutoff if you ask it 90 days? I, you know, I don't know specifically whether or not the regulations speak to that. Um, but certainly within 60 days, you can ask for an updated report. Uh, Lynn would like to know, we run a manufacturing facility with a heavy equipment, or sorry, with heavy equipment. Would the line operators be considered to be in a safe, safety sensitive position? Um, most likely, uh, because they are going to be the individuals who are out on the floor. They're the ones who are um, watching what's going on. If they need to jump in, they are going to have to jump in. Um, so if you have that type of line manager that has that as part of their job description of jumping in, if something's going wrong or if someone's out and they need to do something, then yeah, that would also fall under a safety sensitive position. But if they're the type of line manager where they're sitting on a chair the whole time and they are never to touch any of the equipment, then it may not necessarily be uh, someone who's in a safety sensitive position. So again, it's going to be based on what the employee actually does and is expected of him or her. Uh, Lisa says, I have a consent form for drug screening, which indicates that if the test comes back positive, it may be grounds to deny or terminate their employment. Is this okay to use or must it be on the offer letter? That is a fantastic form to have, and I actually recommend that everybody have it. Um, you should definitely put it in the offer letter, maybe not necessarily all those words, but do have that condition in there. And if you're having the employee sign that, or the prospective employee sign that in order to start the, the testing, um, that's good. But you should definitely have it in the offer letter because that's the first thing that they're going to receive and you're putting them in notice right away. Um, but yeah, that form is fantastic. Everybody should have one. Uh, in addition to the the offer letter. The offer letter is more uh, if you don't have that form um, and having it in there. But again, I just think that that is a great thing and a great tool to use regardless. Cool. Um, Jesse would like to know, do you recommend an offer letter for all employees, even if they are hired for low level jobs? If so, what information should be in those letters? That's a great question. Um, my recommendation is that if you're going to require any sort of background check uh, of those employees, be it criminal, drug, financial, et cetera, that absolutely you should offer, put an, an, an offer letter together. Their offer letter is going to be a lot less um, descriptive than the first slide that we went through, so you're not necessarily going to have the confidentiality, non-disclosure, non-compete stuff, but basically it's going to be congratulations, you, you know, we're providing you with a conditional offer for a laborer, and you're, uh, you're going to be working in the um, a stocking room and the the requirements are that you have to lift boxes. Um, as part of this offer, your salary will be X and it's conditioned upon you receiving uh, whatever type of background check that you put in there. Um, if you're not going to be requiring any sort of conditions of a laborer, i.e. background check, criminal check, uh, financial check, uh, there's no obligation for you to do an offer letter, but I always advise that it doesn't hurt um, because at least you're putting the employee on notice of what the requirements are, that what position they're going to, and if and when they start their job and they start saying, well, I wasn't hired for that position, you'll have something in writing from them. But that that's more innocuous, and if you have a really big company, it may not make sense to have that from everybody because it may be a, a paperwork disaster for you, but um, it doesn't hurt one way or another. But the only time that it, that I highly recommend that you do it is uh, for ever, you know, even low-level employees is if you're going to require uh, pre-employment uh, screenings. All right, we have two questions left here. So if you're looking to sneak anything in, this would be your last call. Uh, Ken asks, if we have a policy in the handbook addressing drug testing, 
but have not implemented pre-employment drug testing, can we start drug testing going forward? I'll take that. Um, yeah, you can certainly do that. Uh, again, as if I'm assuming you're a private employer, if you're a impl private employer, you can uh, you know, amend your policy manual at any point in time. So you can always change that at Lickety Split and include it in there. And yes, there's nothing preventing you from doing pre-employment screening, even if it's not in your policy manual. Again, you just make sure that you're not treating people differently. Make sure you're treating um, all different protected classes the same. Uh, giving them the same opportunities, and that you put it in your offer letter that there is going to be screening and that is a condition of employment when uh, you decide to hire them. Okay, last one comes from Diane, who asks, and this is actually a follow-up from before, are you recommending against verbal offers of employment contingent upon completing the reference checks? We do not do drug testing or credit checks, just a criminal history check. I think as a general notion, you want to have your offers in writing so that it's clear that you're doing um, some kind of background check. Uh, employers, or I should say applicants, um, will often you know, hear one thing and not understand fully what's going on. You're always best protected when you reduce the expectations to writing. So uh, all things being equal, yes, I would recommend that you put all your verbal offers in writing and you're clear about the um, criteria on which those offers are based. And just remember that under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that criminal background checks also apply and as Amy went through more in detail, and as you can go back and look at the slides, there's again certain notice provisions that you have to comply with. And if um, everybody or anybody ever challenges it, the written permission is always best. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I, I highly recommend that if you do any sort of pre-employment screening, even if it's just one of the three that we've been talking about, or even some other um, screenings that other companies may require because of their business that you put that offer in writing. Or, or that can be an offer in writing. I apologize. Well, that's all of them. So thank you so much for everything. This was such an information-packed webinar. Uh, don't forget, all of you will be receiving a recording of today's webinar and PowerPoint slides via email. Lastly, when you close out of the webinar, a survey will come up on your screen that we hope you'll fill out so we can understand how to best provide you important information in a webinar format. Our next webinar, The Anatomy of a Lawsuit, What You Need to Know, will take place Wednesday, December 13th. So by all means, feel free to register for that one right on our homepage, and we will see you there. So until next time, for Liz Garcia and Amy Guerin, this is Vinny Civitello thanking you for being with us this morning and wishing you a great day.